Hello and welcome to the last and fifth video from this sort series. We will inspect a sort with over 30 steps. If you haven't seen the four previous videos that are meant to prepare for this last step, I would encourage you to do so. But let's get to it. Welcome to this channel. Sorts have pretty small tolerances in order to work well. This inspection should help you to decide for a sort or to find a defect in a sort you own that has to be taken care of. However, I will not care about the looks in this inspection. I won't care about a mirror polish blade surface, for example. And even the sharpness that can be worked on is minor important to me as long as the blade is good. So without further ado, here is the inspection. Step 1. The hardness level of tang and blade is within usable tolerances and has to be provided from the producer. It is not so important for the sharpness, but it is very important for the structural integrity of the blade itself. The hardness of the blade is usually in the range of 50 to 56 Rockwell hardness. But more importantly, the blade should be tempered and relaxed evenly. Here we have a 50 to 53 hardness level <clears throat> measured by Rockwell hardness cone, which is a diamond cone of a 120 degrees that was pushed against the blade after quench hardening and tempering, of course. That is comparable with HV30 Vickers hardness grade of 560 or a HB Brunel hardness grade of 525. A tensile strength can be expected of 1950 Newton per square millimeter, about 200 kilograms per square millimeter. The tang can and should be tempered softer to less the brittleness and to give more toughness, therefore. The tang is relaxed to 30 HRC or 286 HB or 302 HV. That leaves us with a tensile strength of 950 Newton per square millimeter, about 100 kilograms per square millimeter. Remember, the blade has a lot of material available to be hard and remain strong, while the tang is little and not strong, so it must be supported from the hip parts. Step 2. The material of the blade is also to be acquired from the producer. 1045, 1060, 1095, 5160 steel being the most common ones. Stainless is a no-go for sword blades. Damask steel, if it is cheap, not recommendable at all. Here we have 5160 spring steel. 0 0.56 to 0.64% carbon. 0.75 to 1% manganese, which is a given mostly. 0 0.70 to 0.90% chromium, important. 0.15 to 0.35% silicium. 0.04% max sulfur, which is more a impurity. 0.035% max phosphorus, which is also a impurity. Overall, a 1060 steel with a chromium content that eases the hardening process and gives the blade a little more
toughness, ductility and tensile strength. This is very good steel and makes me very happy that we can afford to have steel like this nowadays. Step 3. The total weight. As you know from video 1, the total weight is outmost important. More than 1.7 kilograms is the limit for normal use long swords, on my opinion. Swords above this can be still used but will demand a lot of strength. The speed of your moves will be lessened with heavy swords also. The sword will move you with it to a certain degree because of the weight. Here we have 1.56 kilograms that gives us hope of a manageable longsword in handling. Weight distribution is not reflected here and can be still a problem. Remember, while the total weight point of balance and pivot point can't guarantee us a good sword, they can indicate a bad one. Step 4. Point of balance. Three to five fingers away should the point of balance be from the cross guard. Since my grip centers my hand, one centimeter behind the cross guard I will have to add this to my observation. A good indicator if a sword will feel blade heavy or not, but don't forget the total weight will show itself more dominant and the weight distribution could be still bad. Here is the point of balance close to the cross guard and that looks very promising for this kind of sword. Refer to video 1 for more information on this topic. Step 5 Oscillating notes. The oscillation note or notes one on the grip being the most important one. This note stiffens the blade during the applied force with the hand. At this note we have little oscillation during impact and therefore not only the hand is calmer but also the little tang is less stressed of the incoming forces. This note will almost always be in effect while the other one on the blade is there but cannot be particularly used in a fight because you don't care about the note but about to hit the opponent. However, the note on the blade can be used for static target cutting, but there is still a problem. Watch video 1 for more information. The note on the blade is called the sweet spot, by the way. Here is the note on the dominant hand on the grip and the other one is on the weak of the blade so it's good step six pivot point the pivot point is very important for the blades behavior in cutting and edge impact as mentioned in video 1. This sword has an inward pivot and shows therefore an excellent blade behavior when you hit something with this point. Unfortunately the blade will behave very uneasy away from the pivot closer to the tip. which is also caused by the smaller blade cross section and the higher impact 
speed at this area. However, like I said, excellent behavior around the pivot point and good behavior from the pivot to the strong of the blade can be expected here. If the pivot point is not on the oscillation node, but close by, you should prefer to hit static targets with the pivot and not with the sweet spot. Further information on this issue in video 1. The pivot shows also indirectly the relationship of the point of balance to the grabbing hand. But the initial appearance of the pivot point depends on the weight distribution also. This is a rich and difficult topic. Watch video 1 for a better understanding. Is the pivot point inward, like here, everything that is stroke with the blade beyond that point will cause a stronger bouncing back of the blade and the impact power will be lessened. Pivot points are very often placed on the tip of a blade, which is also beneficial in some ways, but all of this in video 1 of this series. Step 7. A centered central ridge and or fuller speaks of a quality blade. However, if it doesn't appear to be exactly in the middle of, the blade can still perform well in a functional way. However, if the fuller or central ridge diverse too much, the blade is probably not produced by a skilled man and has to be seen as mistrustful. Step 8. The blade comes straight out of the crossguard, is mandatory for fast blade moves. This is also for structural and aesthetical reasons desirable. A not good centered grip channel where the tank goes through can also be the reason for the blade not coming out straight. On uh, this sort, the blade goes a little to one side, but not too bad. In this case, it is not a crooked tank, but the grip that is a little off. However, this should be not a problem. Step 9. The blade itself is straight, symmetrical and even for structural stability. This sword has a little bigger shoulder on one side, which doesn't concern me. It is only on the very bottom apparent and shouldn't have any effect at all. Symmetrical blades won't help you when moved. 
but they won't work against you either. I will do a move now which I forbid you to do because it is very dangerous and can literally kill you or others in your vicinity. The blade will be accelerated and decelerated and vice versa as fast as I can. The forces will even cause the blade to bend. Since I also move the blade towards my body, a sudden break or loss of control could hurt me badly. I do it for demonstrational purposes to show how well and fast a longsword can be moved and how stable the whole concept is with a good hilt. A faulty sword will break and endanger everybody around it, so don't do it. Note, symmetrical blades will show their misalignment by getting out of their linear flight path. Curved blades will show an even worse movement behavior which is expected. Again, this test is not good for curved blades and not to be performed by anybody in general. Step 10. Profile taper is logic for the sword use. There are more artistic shaped blades with all kinds of profile taper, but normally there shouldn't be an issue as long as the blade narrows to the point and maintains an acceptable blade width. This sword shouldn't get any smaller on the weak, otherwise the blade has not enough strength to cope with blows. If you want to know more, check video 3. Step 11. Distal taper check. There are blades with no distal taper at all and they can still be pointy. The blade gets less stiff on the weak with a distal taper applied because that narrows the blade towards the point. But the less weight doesn't stress the strong of the blade too much either. So a good compromise between structural stability and weight distribution should be applied. By normal long swords, a distal taper is desired. It shows also a certain quality of the blade and shifts a lot of weight closer to the center of balance. However, it shouldn't get too thin, of course. Here we have six point two millimeters on the bottom and two millimeters on the top. The transformation from a fuller to the flat diamond is for this blade needed because of the otherwise too much weakened upper part. Step 12. The blade is not damaged or rusted and shows a good flexibility that is not too easy applied. Good blade material likes to rust and it starts usually with black spots. This blade is okay. The blade damage is not referring to marked edges, but damages like little cracks, which are hard to detect, or even visible impurities in the material itself. Looks good to me here. 
The blade is flexible and flexes back. This test doesn't reflect the blade's behavior on edge impact so much. But it reflects the ability to swallow forces by oscillation. This flexibility, but also the certain needed stiffness, is actually a way to get a hardness indication without the use of any test apparatuses. Of course, the distal taper will also influence greatly the stiffness. Be careful with this test. You don't want a blade piece jump into your face or cut your hand. This sword is remarkably stiff for its blade features. This leads me to think that we have a good hardness here. Check video 2 for more information. Step 13. The blade is wide enough. A wide blade is a good ability to withstand impact shocks. Usually the strong of the blade is used to stop oncoming blows. We have a very wide blade base. Here we have 55.5 millimeters and a relatively little fuller. So a lot of material that is present here. The strong should be tough enough to cope with other blades. This is also mentioned in video 3. Step 14. The blade length is according to your height. I am 181 meters, that is about 5'11", and a blade length from 90 centimeters turned out to be very good for me. 5 more centimeters would be already too long for me. This blade is luckily 89 centimeters and comes very close to my perfect blade length. A too long sword will get ground contact often when moved around. Step 15. The edge is sharp. It is historically and technically correct if the blade fails to be sharp at the strong for half sorting. That is to grab the blade with your hand and use it to pinpoint the opponent's gaps of his armor or to just push through it or at least to push him away from you. Half sorting is helpful in wrestling too. Here we have that fail sharpness approximately as long as the fuller is. By half sorting you can also grab the pommel with your dominant hand and the blade shortly after the cross guard to increase the reach of the blade. 
this blade is not equally sharp on both sides but that can be corrected easily not a showstopper for me of course a sword for a lot of money should show more precision remember it is not only the edge but especially the edge angle that contributes to cutting if you are into cutting you should pay a lot of attention to the blade's cross section but every common cross section can deliver at least satisfactory results I talked about this more deeply in video 2 Step 16 The tang is drawn out of the blade as one piece Blades must not be welded. Check video 3 for that. You will create a brittle layer and the weld will not hold a welded rod as a tang is rubbish. These swords are only fit for decoration purposes. You can stop here if the sword is a welded or has a welded rod or if a part of the tang is welded or the tang itself is welded on the blade the sword is not usable period there are difficult welding techniques though that could bind satisfactory but they are surely not applied at normal swords it is very dangerous to use those swords, they can break any time. This sword has a solid tang that is by itself not stable enough, but we get enough stability with the support of the hilt. We can expect a good tensile strength here if the heat treatment was done right. Step 17. The blade shoulders are a little sunken in the cross guard with little tolerances. This prevents a other blade to go in between the cross guard and the blade. This sunken fit can also support the tang from the flat side of the blade better and doesn't allow the forces to break the blade from the flat where it is the weakest and that's at the tang for this we would probably also need a higher part of the cross guard in the middle of the flat side of the blade to get this better supporting effect this comes with a fuller very unlikely though good to have the oscillating node close to this weak spot too difficult to tell how much a blade can take from the side there's even a how named prellhau that is executed with the flat and should let the blade flex towards the head of the opponent. This how is not mentioned in earlier times and leads me to think that this is probably a more civilian sporty idea with the use of feather bladed swords than a real tactic with a pretty stiff military blade from older times. However, I think the flexing ability of the blade with its oscillation nodes is the most beneficial behavior that prevents the blade from breaking at the flat too easy. This topic is covered in video 4. Step 18. The blade shoulders lay on the cross guard evenly and fully. This is mandatory 
of having a stable blade rest on the crossguard to guarantee the guidance of oncoming forces around the tank and not to the tank except the tensile force of course. The blade cannot bend at this spot as long as the shoulders rest evenly and fully on the crossguard. As soon as this is not the case anymore, bad effects come into play. As you have seen in video 4, rattling crossguards will hammer against the shoulders and tang and the blade has the freedom to break at this new weak and exposed spot. The blade shoulders should not have sharp corners where the blade goes into the tang. A radius will prevent this corner weakness of the material. Step 19. Cross guard, grip and pommel don't move check. The tight fit of the hilt parts prevent unnecessary stress peaks and therefore accelerated material wear. A sword with moving hilt parts in any direction is very disturbing to say the least. Loose parts will cause the saw to break. Here we try to move the parts in any direction to control a tight fit. Try also to turn the parts, hold the blade as well and do it all over again. Little turning movements, while not ideal, can be tolerated, but even the smallest movement up and down the tang is unacceptable. The sword needs to be repaired if this occurs. Watch video 4 for more information. Move the blade from both sides up and down as well to sense any movement inside of the hilt. Step 20. The cross guard, grip and pommel are in one line with the blade. Sometimes the tang has a shallow spiral or the hill parts are badly aligned with out of center holes where the tang goes through. You would be surprised how little the tolerances are to have everything aligned nicely. Those misalignments are not so obvious with rounded grips and pommels, but with flattened pommels and more square grips, those misalignments get very apparent. Here we have a good alignment that is not perfect of course, but good enough. A good alignment of the hilt to the tang is good for the blade control. While one not so perfect alignment part is acceptable, it can add up to other tolerances and become unacceptable. So don't just look at the hill parts, but check also the blade as a reference point. After all, the blade has to be handled.
step 21. The cross guard is stable enough. Swords with feather blades don't need to have stable cross guards, but full grown military use swords, yes. The petite sizes of cross guards from the 16th and 17th century on are mistrustful and show civilian use features. Two small quillions will bend on heavy impact permanently. This cross guard has enough material in the quillions to withstand blows from other blades. It is also fit to be used as a penetration like part. Check video 4 for more information. Step 22. The cross guard is about 22 cm. The quillion should not get in the way when it comes to sword handling. The quillions will collide with your arm if too long. On the other hand, they should extend as far as to give the most protection possible. About 22 cm is a good length of the cross guard as a whole. The cross guard could be a little longer on this sort, but it is okay as it is. Better a little shorter than too long. It can be very irritating if the cross guard gets in the way while turning the sword. Especially because the turning takes place while you do the blow. Step 23. The shape of the cross guard is helpful. A shallow negative angle toward the blade helps catching an incoming blade. The established bind doesn't allow the other blade to slide on your arm too easy. It is a nice feature that just helps a little to take control of the other blade. This cross guard angles a little forward and has ramps at the very end of the quillions to enhance the described effect. The edges on this ends can be used as penetration points also, as mentioned in video 4. Step 25. The grip has no gap between the cross guard and the pommel. Now this is very important. As you know from video 4, a gap between the grip and the cross guard or the pommel is a structural weakness of the sword and causes the tank to break eventually. This is very serious and has to be fixed before the sword is used again. This sword has no gaps and the grip is tightly squeezed in between. The little tang just has to withstand the stretching forces. No other angled forces can reach it. The grip should not show signs of compression at the touching areas to the cross guard and the pommel either.
In this case, the wooden core would be not strong enough to deal with the pushing forces it is exposed to and gives way by getting compressed. Not good at all. This sort has no compressed areas and the cross guard and pommel sit nice and evenly on the front sides of the grip. The front sides should not show any radius either. They should be completely flat, otherwise the tank gets too much stressed again. So no gap on the whole front side area of the grip to the other hip parts. Step 26. The leather is tightly on the grip. The leather should have been soaked a little with glue before actually glued on to the grip. Otherwise the bounding is less strong. There should be a bounding layer between the wood and the leather actually. Hemp cord is used very often for this. The hemp cord is wrapped around the wooden core of the grip and ensures a perfect bounding layer between the wood and the leather. It even helps reinforcing the wooden core. After the leather is glued on, it is wrapped again with hemp cord to really squeeze the leather on the surface of the grip. This temporary wrapping is removed afterwards and leaves the cord marks in the leather. There are many other ways to build a handle, but this is my favorite one. It works very good and allows also raises to be implemented. This grip is done exactly as it should and the leather won't go off. Check if you can move the leather on the surface. Step 27. The grip fits your hand and is long enough for long swords. There should be a hands with space between the grabbing hands. The separation of the hands allows more control of the sword and stronger moves by the means of the lever principle. If you look at your grabbing hand, it shows a more squarey inside contour. So a more squarey grip is nice to have. Anyways, the grip should feel comfortable. But remember, a too tight grip is not helping the tank enough to deal with the forces. A little bigger grip, once you are used to, is actually very nice. The blade control is increased and the stronger hand movement can be compensated by going a little more into your knees. Video 4 covers this topic also. Step 28. The raises on the grip make sense. To have raises on the grip is nice, but not a must. Here we have the possibility to stay a little behind the cross guard, which is good for the hand protection 
or to grab the sword in the middle or to thrust strongly or to have a better hold in half sorting or to catch the sword if the hand was about to slide off or whirl the sword around which is fun too I cannot do it because of the ceiling <sighs> like I said not needed to have but nice to have those different grips could even allow to use a long sword with one hand from the back of a horse But this is just an idea. Step 29. The pummel doesn't have edges where it hurts to grab. The pommel is an important grip extension on a longsword. Therefore, it should be also formed as such. It can be used as a hard part of the sword to hit but it shouldn't hinder you to bring the main part into action, which is the blade. This flattened pommel allows a very good sword control and acts kind of like a joint in connection with the hand. So I am pleased with that. Step 30. The pommel is tightly pinned or screwed. The pommel has to have a safe and reliable connection to the tank. If the pommel can loosen itself, the whole hilt can get loose and the sword can break or the blade flies off and hurts somebody. Pinned connections offer the best safety. However, I am not so in opposition to nuts if the method is applied right. So check this connection of damage or looseness frequently. The problem with this mounting is mentioned in video 4. Step 31. You should like the sword. You should be able to identify with it. Maybe it goes with your personality, or with your ancestors, or with your taste, or with a special time period you are attached to, or interested in, etc. etc. Make it yours and have fun with it. This was the last topic of the sword series. And I am smiling because it was a lot of work. I will make many more videos. Also how to use a sword of course. We can now branch out of this excursion meaning we can go into the specifics of special issues more, which were mentioned but not covered deeper in this video series. 
I hope it was helpful and if you disagree with me, then build up your case and you will learn something more about sorts again. It was also a little experiment for me to do it in English. I learn almost exclusively from English speaking people and I enjoy it very much. The English speaking world is very dominant in the internet and the biggest source of knowledge. This fact makes me to address my topic to English speakers because this is the most fruitful ground. So thank you already for allowing me to take part in this fascinating topic. See you hopefully in my next videos. Take care and I'll be back.